Hello, this is a redo of the chapter I just did. I realized I didn't do a very good job on it. I shouldn't have done that video at all, to tell you the truth. I was, it wasn't the right point, right time point in, for me to do it. I had a lot on my mind. And so it was kind of uh, messing me up. So, God has had me uh, make a redo of it, and... Here I am, and all praise and glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. All praise and glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord Jesus Christ is coming so very, very soon, and all the glory of this video, and every video, and all the comments, thumbs up, likes, everything, I give it all to you, to Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is Read With Me Bible, and we're doing a redo of this chapter. Oops, I had my finger on it. Okay, this is the chapter I'm doing a redo on. This is, Brothers Go to Egypt. And guess who's coming back? Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's coming. Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Lord Jesus Christ is coming. I'm so excited. He is coming. Better keep a watch. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Now, Joseph's brothers go to Egypt. You can read this in Genesis chapter 42, chapter 45, and chapter 47. It's also in the book of Jasher. If you ever heard of the book of Jasher, it's one of the Apocrypha. It's one of the books removed from the Bible. I do believe it's in the Ethiopian Bible. I think that's the only Bible I can think of that's in um, offhand. Um, and yeah. So if you want to read the book of Jasher, it really goes in detail about... Um, you know, Jacob and Joseph li Joseph's life, and even Moses, especially Moses. I learned so much about Moses I didn't even know about before until I read the book of Jasher. And I do believe the book of Jasher is God-inspired work. So, yeah. And if you heard the last chapter, you'll know that um, Jacob was sold to Poplatar. As you can see here in this picture. It was the end of the last chapter. So, I'm just going to do a, a little explanation of what's going on here. Well, Jacob lived in Egypt. After he was sold, he worked as the um, second command in Poplatar's household. Poplatar was at the top. And now, Poplatar was some very powerful man in Egypt. He wasn't a pharaoh, but he was a very powerful man. And so, he had put Joseph in control of all his goods and household and everything, except for his wife. And his wife had became completely filled and possessed by lust. And she had lusted after Joseph to a point where she went absolutely insane. And she really went after him. And when Joseph saw her, he would just look at her feet. He would not look her in the eye. And she continued to go after him and harass him and try to get him in her bedchamber. And it never worked. It never happened. And one day, everyone was down the river. She said she was ill. So she stayed behind, and Joseph didn't celebrate this um, type of thing, and he, you know, stayed home and did his, his master's work, Poplatar's work. And, well, when he went into the building, she was at the steps, and she was dressed in her most fine clothing, with perfumes and everything, trying to attract him to come into her bedchamber with her. And she, he wouldn't. He went around her, went to work, and while he was at his desk working, she came in with a sword and told him that he had to lie with her or he would be killed. And out of fear for his life, he fled from her. But her, her knife, or I mean sword, knife and sword are basically the same thing, just sword's a lot longer. But anyway, her sword had stabbed right through his cloak. It didn't hurt him, but it stabbed his cloak and his cloak came off and she had his cloak with a stab hole in it. Well, then she just devises another plan. Since he won't lie with her, she's going to, you know, have him thrown in prison. And so, she goes back, changes her outfit, puts on the veil of uh, mourning and sadness and abuse, laying in her bed, and she's got his outfit. She told, um, when Poplatar comes back, she tells her husband everything that happened, which was all a bunch of lies. And she lied like a rug. And Joseph was thrown in, in the dungeon, you know, in prison. 
and he was being whipped and while he was being whipped they did state that the one-year-old child of Poplatar and that woman was in there in the same room as he being whipped no child should be there but anyway the child's mouth was opened by God and the child spoke and this what the child spoke was that his that the child's mother did all this that was you know the child's mother was to blame Joseph didn't do anything wrong he was righteous and good and so then later with the trial they realized at the trial that it was obvious enough that she had stabbed through the cloak with the knife with the sword I don't know why I want to say knife um, with the sword and caused damage to his cloak and it was found that she was guilty but he but although Joseph stayed in prison he stayed locked in prison while he was in prison though it states in the book of Jasher she went after him in prison lusting after him to a point where she was just she was just mad absolutely completely mad and he wouldn't he would do anything with her and she finally did give up she finally did give up but it, it took a long time for her to give up though she kept going to the prison cell and visiting him and trying to get him and he wouldn't give so while he's in prison there later on gets put in a, uh, a baker and a uh, wine taster guy some guy with wine that both worked for the pharaoh the wine taster was thrown in prison because he, there was like flies or something a bug in the wine whereas the, the baker was thrown in prison because he had put arsenic in the, in the baking and it was found out before the pharaoh partaked in it so they were both thrown in prison while they were in prison they both got prophetic dreams and joseph was gifted by god to decipher the dreams and he deciphered the wine tasters ones that he would go that he would go back to working his job for the pharaoh whereas the baker would be hanging off a tree you know be executed well he told the wine guy to tell the pharaoh you know so he could get out because he wanted it out of dungeon but God knew, noticed that he was putting his faith and trust in, in that guy over him. And so the guy never said anything. He didn't talk about it and forgot about him. Because God wanted Joseph to learn to trust him, not man. So time went by. And the Pharaoh had a dream. And the dream was about a, about like a group of, of like seven kind that were fat. And then seven very skinny kind came out of nowhere and ate up all the, all the fat kind and it was the same thing with the second dream which was corn there was all this fat corn and the skinny corn came and there was and those seven corn ate seven skinny corn ate up the seven fat corn you can read this all in the book of Genesis or in the book of Jasher and the Pharaoh wanted someone to interpret it he calls all the soothsayers the magicians all these people in magicians, soothsayers, wise men, everyone all over the place to decipher his dream. And they give him all kinds of meanings, but none of them are true. They're all nothing but a bunch of lies. And the Pharaoh knows it. He just instantly knows it. Like, you know, none of it's true. None of it makes any sense to him what these people are saying because these people are either listening to their own flesh and giving him answers. Or they'll listen to demons, fallen angels, and even Satan himself, the hater of all good, giving him answers. And none of them know the answer. Of course they don't. Demons don't know what you know what God's doing. They can only best decipher to the best of their ability. Satan doesn't know everything God's doing. Tries to know, I guarantee you, Satan tries to know everything. But Satan doesn't. Satan's just an angel. And so, yeah. Satan's a fallen angel. So anyway. He would realize that none of these people knew the information, and he was now going to, he wanted to execute all the wise men, the soothsayers, magicians, and all these people, because no one could give him the correct answer. And so, as time went on, uh, the wine guy speaks to the Pharaoh and tells him that he had a dream, and this guy, this Hebrew guy that was in the prison interpreted for him and the bakers as well and they both came out valid in truth. So the Pharaoh wants him brought in and Joseph is brought in. He stands before the Pharaoh and Pharaoh gives him his dream and Jacob deciphers it 
with the Holy Spirit leading him, because the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. And so the dream was deciphered perfectly. And after that, the Pharaoh is like, well, I can't put him, you know, you know, second in command to take control of um, the, you know, the storage of the food and everything. If he doesn't, you know, if he's not like, like equal, like he has to know like 75 languages to be able to be, be have that position. And at that time period, Joseph barely knew any Egyptian. He mainly knew nothing but Hebrew. So while that night was going on, God sent an angel, and while Joseph was still in the prison, an angel at night, that night, and taught Joseph how to speak all 75 languages. That's unheard of. Do you know anyone that could speak 75 languages? I don't know anyone. I know some people that know how to speak a few languages. I know a girl I work with. She knows how to speak English, Japanese, and South Korean, but that's the only languages she knows so far. And that was a lot of languages to me. Knowing I speak fluently three languages is amazing to me. But uh, I don't know anyone who speaks 75. The most I ever heard was somebody when I was in um, Comp 110 or was it Comp 111 in college um, about some guy that I was reading about that knew how to speak seven languages. So do you know anyone who speaks 75 or any, anywhere close to that? The average person I know usually knows only two languages. That's most people I know. They usually know how to speak either both English or, and Spanish or English and Armenian or English and German, you know that, but they usually don't know more than that, or English and Latin. So it's, it's amazing. Really, it is. And so he came back when they brought him in and, you know, back into the pharaoh for you know for some type of questioning or something and he was able to walk up to the pharaoh and come up to him face to face speaking all these different languages including speaking it fluently in egyptian which just amazed them and then he spoke all the other languages of other people that were in that in that era in that building with pharaoh that you know from different other places and he spoke their languages too their tongues and they were all like what the they were completely stunned and in shock and then after that, Joseph got a high place in Pharaoh's office. He became second to Pharaoh, and he was worshipped. Now people worshipped him and looked out to him and everything and bowed down to him. Which, in my opinion, nobody should be worshipped or bowed down to other than Lord Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God. But that's how it was in Egypt back then. So, now, Joseph knew that there was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of, of hard times. So they've during the seven years of plenty, Egypt, you know, gathered up food, stored up food. It was very important to store up food and collect up food and have tons of food. And I would say you should store up some food. Store up food. Even a little bit of food, if it's anything, even a small amount of food. I mean it, it going food prices are astronomical. Just don't tell me any different. It's astronomical. I can't believe how expensive it's gotten. I mean, some people pay like well over a hundred dollars for a bag of dry dog food. It's ridiculous. So it's yeah, food prices. No matter if it's human food, animal food, it's just expensive. But try your best with the Lord leading to you know gather up some food some shampoos, conditioners, supplies to survive in the coming days. Because sooner or later, yeah, you're not going to be able to go to the grocery store. Remember when um, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans? Yeah, it was very hard times then. Yeah, the stores were kind of not open, you know what I mean? And when the people that did get there, they kind of found a way to get them in there. And yeah, the, by the time they were done, you can guess what the shelves look like. So, it's better to have, you know, some supplies on hand. You know? You don't have to go, like, full-blown, complete prepper to a point where you have food on top of food on top of food on top of food. Most people can't afford that. They Most people can't afford, afford a ginormous food cache with bunker and a secret place in a, in a different area and all that. The average person who pays rent and lives in a small, tiny apartment 
can't afford that. So you rely on the Lord and ask him to take care of you and to bless your food. Remember with Elijah and how he had, he went to that woman's house and she only had a little bit of like a crude of oil left and that was a little bit of like flour in a tin or something. And he blend, he blessed the food and guess what? God made the food last. So, and remember with Lord Jesus Christ, with the, ma with the masses, he had, you know, like seven loaves and, and two fishes and he he asked God to bless them, and it multiplied them exceedingly enough to feed like over 4,000 people. If God can do that, he can do anything. Think about it. He created every hair on your head. So when it comes to food, he'll, he'll supply you. It doesn't hurt to, you know, to try to gather up some food as the Lord leads. But leave it in God's hands first and foremost. God will take care of you. And going by where you live also, you may have to flee. So take it all up to the Lord in prayer and ask him for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and turn to him. And remember, God has your back. If you're a true child of God, he will take care of you. Anyway, back to the story. So Joseph had gathered up. I don't even think this thing's...